here on behalf of RiskOS Open. I'm going to talk to you about what's been happening. I use my fingers. Yep. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what's been happening uh, since the last show and a couple of things since uh, I was last here at Wakefield in case anyone missed in between. Uh, so most notably, of course, was the uh, open sourcing of RiskOS last October. Um, which I'll cover in a little detail, and then there's a pile of things about um, bounties past, present, and future. So last October at the uh, London show, the license for the main part of the OS was changed from what you might previously have called a castle license, which was a shared source license where you can uh, use the OS for personal use, but if you want to use it in anything commercial, you had to pay a license fee. It's now moved to a totally open source license. Uh, um, the one that was chosen was Apache. Um, don't worry too much about the distinction uh, between different license types. The main thing is that it's one that's recognized by the uh, FOSS um, people, for the Free Open Source Software Organization. Uh, so you can now call RiskOS truly open source. Now, who cares is my question. From a practical point of view, if you are all downloading things from Rules website, you won't notice any difference. The day after the license changed, it was exactly the same OS as the day before the license changed. So from a, a user's point of view, there's not actually a great deal of uh, practical difference in uh, a change to the license. Uh, the thing that it does start to unlock is that if you're um, speaking to a company and saying, oh, we'd really like you to sponsor this new chunk of functionality, please, Previously, if you said to them, oh, but by the way, the OS is owned by this commercial company and effectively you're paying their work to be done to add to their, um, own, their property, uh, it was a very difficult discussion to have. Whereas now you can say it's truly open source software. Could you sponsor, you know, if you, I'm going to pick, um, let's pick Arm as an example, not that anyone's been talking to Arm, but if you were to ring up Arm and say, hello, could we have £10,000, please, to make some change? They would have said, well, hang on, why are we giving £10,000 to the castle? That doesn't seem right. So now... Uh, if they're sponsoring open source projects, which is quite a common thing for large companies to do, it's a lot easier conversation to have. And a particular or a more concrete example of that is that um, just shortly after the announcement in uh, October at the London show, um, RiskOS 5 got back on the Raspberry Pi Noobs distribution. Uh, so that's a distribution that you can download from the Raspberry Pi website straight onto your Raspberry Pi, which obviously has a much larger outreach than people that might have trekked to Wakefield or trekked to the London show. Um, it's something that they can download from home. And that was something that was sponsored by Eben at Raspberry Pi. So the conversation was, can we do some work on RiskOS to get it back on Noobs? It'll take this amount of time. And Eben said, oh, yeah, it's an open source project. Yes, I'll, I'll grant that to go ahead. So it, it's, a, it's great at greasing wheels, but from a practical point of view, it's the same RiskOS that you were using the previous day. And talking about, yes, the pie, um, so there's ultimately a circle of life here that uh, the more users that you have, the more developers that you can attract, the more developers that you can attract, the better the software you can get, the better the software that you can get, the more users that you can get, and so on uh, infinitum. So that's the kind of, um, you know, again, it's, it's about greasing wheels, it's about making things uh, uh, lower barrier to entry. On which note, lowering barriers to entry. Um, as at, uh, I think, about 11 o'clock last night, because uh, it was slightly broken yesterday, uh, one of the changes that we've just made recently is uh, to move uh, where the source code to RiskOS is held. So uh, we use a version control system. That's what VCS is short for. Version control system, which allows us to track who changed what and on what date and for what reason. So it gives you a little change log for each um, update that's made. Um, but previously, we were using a system called CVS, which is um, less well known now uh, than some of the other ones. And in particular, the one that we've migrated to is called Git. Uh, nothing to do with people being cantankerous uh, at all. So it's, I, I assume it's not, uh, nothing to do with people being cantankerous. Um, and that, is it because he's known as being a Git? Okay. <laughs> Okay, all right. So there is a, an element of uh, being cantankerous. Yeah, so move to a system called Git. Now, again, it's a bit much like a license change from a, a practical point of view. That doesn't make any difference to a, an end user. We're still building the same code as yesterday. It's still producing the same ROMs as yesterday and the same uh, applications as yesterday. But in terms of um, familiarity of people wanting to contribute to the OS, 
it's it's one less odd thing that we're doing. So if you if they come to our website and say, oh, yeah, I'd really might like to make a change to that widget application over there, it's a lot easier conversation to have if you can say, oh, well, yeah, we're using Git. You've used Git before. Oh, yeah, I know. I've used that before. It's a, a lot easier conversation to have. So if you wander to uh, gitlab.riskwestopen.org, you can uh, browse the, see if, uh, thingy, not that one, not that one, not that one, that one. Uh, you'll see a page that looks a bit like this, um, and it's arranged in the same directory structure as it was uh, the previous day. I'm trying to see what I'm clicking on. Uh, so for example, let's sit down and click. So you can see this is the, the source code to the Raspberry Pi hardware abstraction layer. You can see when various things were changed and uh, what thing was changed at each date. And if I click on one of those, uh, it will give you the history on that date. So it's basically a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a version control system, much like any other. Um, the key difference here is that it's, it's one that people will be more familiar with if, they want, if they're new or wanting to come and start developing for risk -wise. Right, let's try and find that one. Right. So another thing that has just changed in the last couple of weeks is that the um, stuff that you would be familiar for downloading from our website as one big hard disk image, the uh, hard disk for download, uh, has now been also split up into packages that you can fetch using Pac-Man, uh, which is a, a package manager, nothing to do with the computer game of the same name. Uh, so if you want to see what has changed recently, you can just you only need to download the bits that has changed and install it. And if you're fed up with it, you can uninstall it and nothing will fall to pieces. Um, so at the moment, there's the 28 applications which live on the main hard disk image. Uh, so we'll pretend that the Wi-Fi works. Uh, so if you go to packages.riskwestopen.org, you will see there is a link to uh, add into your installation of Pac-Man. Pac-Man's a free application. Uh, and you can then uh, pick up all of the nightly changes to the hardest for without having to download the whole thing. And then there are also um, package lists for third party packages for people who also host their software there. So it's all, all held in one central place. At the moment, the thing that is missing is the boot application. So the thing that is known as Pling Boot, um, because actually inside that, if you've ever dared rummage inside it, it's built up of lots of other smaller applications inside it. And at the moment, that doesn't logically fit into the way that the pack ma package manager works. So we need to have a bit more of a think about how to subdivide that so you don't end up with a, a, um, a load of conflicts when you try and install it. But hopefully that will be resolved in the next few. There's a plan of how to do that, but it's, um, it requires a bit more thought. On to the um, bounty scheme. Uh, so I'm sure you've, I've definitely shown uh, the picture of the bounty bar before. Um, the idea of the bounty scheme is to try and mop up big tasks that can't reasonably be fitted into uh, someone's weekend. So there are things where they, people will have to take time off work to try and implement it because it's a big or a, com a complicated item. Um, they're primarily funded by you. Uh, there are a few um, commercial organizations that will, will pitch in. So the, um, the previous step of the um, TCPIP stack overhaul had a nice big uh, comedy cardboard check donated to it from uh, RiskWest Developments. So it's, it's mostly funded by uh, actual end users, but there are also some companies that will chip in uh, as and when they think it's something that they want to contribute to. Uh, and the ideas, all they, they don't come out totally out of the sky. Uh, if you want to suggest ideas, uh, I'm all ears, Ben's all ears. Um, come over and see us at the stand and make your suggestions. They ultimately end up on the bounties or the wish list forum on the rule website. Um, and there's also a wiki page that you can edit if you want to add things to the uh, long-term roadmap. And those are the ultimate sources of where new bounties come from. So if anyone recognises uh, Christmas Carol with the Muppets, hope you do. Uh, so we're going to be visited by the ghosts of bounties past, <laughs> bounties present and bounties yet to come. But no, no Michael Caine, sadly. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the bounty scheme, I was doing some quick calculations in the uh, hotel last night and I added up since the scheme was launched in 2011. It's actually accrued £51,000, which I thought was a fairly uh, decent total, more than I was expecting anyway. But. I'm just a tight-fisted northerner. Um, 
And to date, uh, of those, those have resulted in five uh, major projects completed, um, some of which have uh, already made it into stable releases of the OS. So, for example, the, the updates to the JPEG uh, rendering software. There are four live ones, which I'll whisk through in a minute. Uh, there are six uh, open collecting, and there's one uh, which will ultimately answer your question about is there a Git client for RiskOS, uh, which will be opening soon. I'll come back to that one as well. So just closed, as in just completed in the last uh, 24 hours, uh, is the first step of the monster TCP IP bounty. This one was primarily about uh, improving the security of the network stack, so throwing away all of the old crusty SSL uh, support that we used to try and limp by on and replacing it with much more modern uh, TLS support. So that's a, a protocol that you use to talk securely to servers. Uh, so if you're exchanging um, banking details, that sort of thing, uh, the, the previous um, security software was sufficiently old that you can now crack that in real time on a, on a modern computer because it was sort of more than 10 years old. Uh, so that's now all been updated. Um, some of those bits and pieces made it into the previous uh, stable release last April. So that was, uh, we now have a database of trusted certificate authorities inside the internet application. Uh, and the way that certificate handling works is that uh, you have a, a shopping list of people that are allowed to issue certificates and they then hand out the certificates to people that they trust and then there's a, a basically a cascading of trust down to ultimately to the website that you're visiting. So if you ever visit a website that's got HTTPS at the beginning of the address, you can work your way back up that chain and find out who it was that signed the paperwork at the top of the chain and that's what a, a root certificates authority is. He's, it's the person at the top of the chain with a golden biro. Uh, and part, uh, a little side effect on, of the part one of the bounty was to make sure that some of the uh, changes to network addressing, which although we don't actually support it yet, they have corresponding uh, library functions that developers can call. So uh, those are all now in place as well. So if anyone is writing new software, and as long as they start using these new functions, uh, they'll be able to, in the future, support the different addressing types when they come along. Ones that we are looking at at the moment that are currently running are there's various improvements going on to Paint, the bitmap uh, um, sprite editor, uh, particularly to do with uh, supporting all of the new sprite types. So RISC-OS 5.22, I think, about three or four years ago, introduced a lot of new um, color depths and also support for alpha channel, so blended uh, sprites, but you can't actually edit them at the moment. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. So one of the improvements that's coming to paint is the ability to edit those um, alpha channel sprites. Uh, also, um, having an undo and redo. I don't know if it's anything like me. You draw, try and draw a straight line in paint, it goes wrong, and you want to undo that. So that's another of the features. Uh, like draw and edit have, you can press F8 to undo that last operation. So that will be a new feature coming along. Drawing uh, text in a font that's not the ugly system font, so proper outline font uh, support within uh, Paint. Uh, and also some simplifications to the way that the uh, uh, control of Windows works, which uh, I will, I have a Raspberry Pi on this other desk, which I will show some of these things in a moment. So I'll, I'll plod through the couple of slides and then I'll, I'll show you them in action. Another bounty that's uh, currently working is a uh, update to file core to support uh, foreign partition support. Uh, so this is, for example, where we have a Raspberry Pi where actually it boots off a little DOS uh, disk first, and that's the bit where the Raspberry Pi gets its firmware from. And then once you're booted into RISC-OS, you use the rest of the SD card for uh, storing RISC-OS files. Uh, but at the moment, we have to do that by some funky overlaying and sleight of hand behind the scenes. Really, it should be able to support that um, using what's known as MBR, the master boot record, and GUID, which is another partitioning scheme uh, that, that's uh, very well known in uh, other OSs. So you can then have multiple uh, OSs sitting on the same disk at the same time, and Filecore won't trample over all the other ones, as it would do at the moment. Uh, and then the second part to that, or a corollary of that, is that then Filecore itself can put things in partitions, so you end up that you can then subdivide massive hard disk into, into smaller drives that will then appear as several icons on the icon bar. Now, unfortunately, in the, well, this, this is in progress, but uh, it turns out that that was a bit of a can of worms having opened Filecore. If anyone's dared look at it, uh, I counted as 48,123 lines of assembler, 
which is a uh, real eyeball watering uh, to try and update. So ultimately, the conclusion of the, the first part of this uh, bounty was that that's a silly way to proceed, throw it all away and start again writing it in a higher level language such as C. Um, so that way, all, all of the complexity of fiddling around with data structures, you, you let the compiler worry about that uh, rather than having to do it by hand tweezering the data using uh, individual instructions. So it's actually not quite turned into as the project that was originally envisaged. It'll still end up with the same outcome of being able to support partitions, but we'll also end up with a shiny new file call that's written in C so that we can maintain that a lot more easier. That's bad grammar, isn't it? A lot more easily, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so it's running it through my grammar path, so that doesn't make sense, yeah. A lot more e easily in the future. <coughs> On which note, uh, or related to rewriting things in C, is that uh, currently the uh, Norcroft toolchain that is used to compile RiskOS knows about ARM v5, which roughly corresponds to the X scale that was used in the Ionix. Um, and since then, ARM have been busily adding about 70 new instructions to their reduced instruction set computer. Um, <laughs> so there's 120 or something now to worry about. Uh, but some of these are actually quite useful. They do naturally, from writing something in C, they do translate directly into a single instruction. So if you're fiddling around with structures, there are structure manipulation instructions now. So it, uh, that will make things both smaller and faster. Um, but at the moment, the compiler doesn't know about that. So that's one of the things that's being added. Um, then there are a lot of weird media instructions, my favourite of which is USAD8. Quite, I quite like that instruction, just got a nice ring to it, uh, which is an unsigned saturate addition and subtract uh, addition and difference of 8-bit byte lanes in a 32-bit number. You think, why would I ever need that? It's reduced instruction set computing, of course, but they're actually intended for, for DSP applications. They're not things that you would naturally be able to write in C and suddenly realise, oh, yes, of course, I needed a USAD8 instruction for that. Um, but they are useful in inline assembler. So the, the compiler will be able to uh, output those in inline assembler if you're doing things like uh, media processing, you know, th things where you have byte lane oriented data like video and graphics decoding. So yeah, faster, smaller code. Uh, if you uh, are eager to get your hands on uh, and probably break the intermediate versions of the compiler, um, come back to the stand after here. If you're a developer, we'll, we can get you a setup with a beta copy to try and break. If not, stay well away. Uh, another bounty, which I also have a, uh, I think we can look at on the, uh, on the uh, Raspberry Pi, is uh, updating clipboard support in the desktop. So at the moment, you can copy and paste text around in edit and between a lot of third-party applications. But one notable omission is draw. So uh, there's now a new version of draw that can do copying and pasting and dragging and dropping which makes uh, transferring things between other applications a lot easier. So you can, for example, do an illustration in Draw, select it, and drag it in TechWriter, and it will, it will just appear, as in you literally drag it from left to right on the screen. Very nice. Uh, and then an extension to that uh, are the writable icons in the window manager. So whenever you have a dialog box that you can type into, you'll similarly be able to pick that text up, drag it, and drop it around. Right. Uh, and I think the last of the ones that is uh, currently... Uh, that draw? That was the last one. Uh, so in terms of um, the bounties of Christmas yet to come, uh, there are quite a few of these because we've just opened four yesterday. So there are some new ones that you can contribute to. So if you've got some loose change in your pocket on the way around the show today, come over to the stand and we'll take all of your loose change off you. Um, this one's been open for a little while. Uh, it's the USB stack. So this is replacing and uh, converging back with where it originally came from. So in case you don't know, USB stack on the Raspberry Pi and so on. It's based on one that came from NetBSD, which is a Unix-like operating system. Um, but our copy is now quite out of date. It was originally ported in year 2000 for a set-top box uh, design in PACE. Uh, there are a few updates in uh, to get us to roughly 2007, but we're still missing the technology that happened in the intervening uh, 12 years. An easy example of which is there's now something called USB 3, which runs at... Uh, crazy gigabit I can't even remember how many gigabits it is, but it's exceptionally fast. So if you're copying things to and from a memory stick and you could do it by USB 3.0, uh, that would be uh, a, a great speed benefit to us. Uh, and then one of the other things that's been chucked into this same bounty is to improve some of the peripheral support. And you get some of that by doing the update, 
because obviously the guys at NetBSD have also been adding support for other peripherals that we can't currently use. And Ethernet chipsets is an easy example of that. So if you've got an Ethernet dongle, the odds of it working with RiskOS today are reasonably slim, or you have to be very careful about which ones you buy, uh, whereas the NetBSD guys support a much wider range. So we should start to inherit some of those changes by fast-forwarding from where we were in the equivalent of about 2007. The other biggie that's open uh, is the update to the network stack. Uh, if you compare what I've been saying in the text on the previous slide with this one, the origins are FreeBSD is a slightly different Unix variant, but it, again, it's a Unix-like operating system. Uh, and this uh, was last majorly updated in 1996. Uh, so our network stack is um, old enough to own a car, probably, probably get a mortgage as well here. Yeah. Um, so our, our network stack is pretty old. Um, now in step one, we've papered over a few of the cracks so that um, there aren't so many uh, massive gaping security holes as there previously were. So um, in particular, there was a protocol uh, that you could accidentally find yourself connecting to a bank. Uh, and uh, it was a protocol that has a known weakness that if you cut the wire and sit in the middle of it, you can spoof the transactions going in between so you could see all your bank details going past. So we plugged up that hole and some of the worst ones, um, but there is still a significant divergence in the same way that the USB stack has significantly diverged uh, in those intervening uh, 23 years. So this is a really big um, bounty. It's, it's actually the only uh, five-figure target that we've currently got open. We, we try and put um, rough guesstimates of how much each of these projects would cost to run uh, if you were working at the equivalent of McDonald's burger flipping rate. Uh, and this one has come out, even at McDonald's burger flipping rate, this has come out at a five-figure sum. So it's an absolute whopper this. Just because there are so many things in the OS that have bits of uh, networking interwoven into them. If you use ShareFS, okay, so that doesn't go over the internet, but it's still using the network stack. Some new ones. These are, these are new bounties as at yesterday. Um, so unusually or uncharacteristically for rule, uh, this is a step three of four, despite not having yet started step two of four. So there are some uh, project management logistics to avoid. Uh, if this one, if this one overtakes the previous one, there's going to be uh, a bit of a nightmare because you won't be able to build on top of it because uh, the previous step was the bit where a lot of the uh, foundation work was laid. Um, but there is some new stuff that we don't have here. So because our uh, stack dates from 1999 and the Wi-Fi Alliance, whose logo I've blatantly stolen, uh, they were formed in 1999, so our network stack is three years older than the Wi-Fi Alliance. So you can see why we don't have Wi-Fi things. Um, and one of the things in this bounty is, um, aside from introducing all of the new uh, encryption uh, profiles that you need for varying levels of security to log in and send data over, over the air so that people, again, can't, can't snoop on what you're typing, uh, is a fancy desktop front end. So if you're about to go on a plane, you want to be able to switch to airplane mode so that you don't uh, cause interference if you're sitting uh, doing things on your laptop. Um, and also, uh, we've included a couple of low-level drivers. So uh, somewhere on, if you've got a Raspberry Pi 3 or later, there's a chip sitting in the corner, which is actually a Wi-Fi chip. I mean, currently, it does nothing because we don't have any drivers for it. So one of the outputs of this bounty is to crank up the uh, Pi's Wi-Fi chipset and then there's another major family, uh, if you search on the internet, if you for Atheros, you'll find that actually that's kind of the granddaddy of many, many, many uh, Wi-Fi chipsets. So our idea there is that although Atheros itself, I don't think you can actually buy Atheros chips anymore, you'll find that if you have an Atheros driver, most likely it will be able to talk to a Wi-Fi chipset that you've chosen. It's a very common, um, it's a very common chipset in the same way that the uh, any people like their chip numbers. Any 2000 was a really... Uh, common Ethernet chip back in the day, and then many people cloned it. So although you might not have been aware that you had an NE2000, it was probably NE2000 compatible just because it was so very uh, popular. It's the granddaddy of Ethernet chips. Atheros is the granddaddy of Wi-Fi chips. Another new bounty as at, uh, as at yesterday is um, pulling together all the loose strings that hold together the toolbox. So the user interface toolbox is the thing that helps you write desktop applications easily by offloading a lot of the um, GUI interaction work to a set of modules, or toolbox modules. Um, but due to the uh, varied and potted history of RISC-OS, 
Um, the stuff that happened in RiskWest Select wandered off in one direction and added some new features, and the stuff in RiskWest 5 wandered off in another direction and fixed a load of bugs. But somehow it would be nice to bring those two back together because it's very confusing for a user to know, I've got this application, do I go to RiskWest Limited's website and try and download their modules? Ah, but they don't work on RiskWest 5, and then, oh, but now I need to change that. Oh, it's also complicated, and it shouldn't be complicated. It should be possible to end up with a superset of both. So you have all of the fixes that have happened on the RiskWest 5 side of things uh, and the features that got added to RiskWest Select. And this is another instance, going back to my wanting concrete examples of where changing to an open source license has proved useful, is that that helps build new bridges to uh, our friends at RiskWest Limited, or RiskWest Limited as was now 3QD. Um, I think there was possibly some uh, animosity between the parties previously. I, I don't, did anyone pick up on that? I'd, uh, so if you can now say, oh, well, it's a fully open source OS. There's no political ties attached here. You, can, you take the source code. If you want to integrate it into RiskWest Select, that's fine. There's no license fees. Take it, go for it. So it's another example of somewhere where um, yeah, changing to a different license should help build some bridges to make that happen. Um, and then as a side effect of that, if anyone's been past our stand today and seen an ever-growing pile of books that we produce, uh, there is a plan for Rule to update the user interface toolbox book, which would then include the new feature, the new API features that um, came from RiskWest Select. You'll end up with, again, a, a one definitive tome or one definitive PDF uh, to go to to look at those features. I hope there aren't too many more of these. Somebody's, somebody's really uh, stacked me up with slides today. Um, another, one, another new bounty opened as at yesterday. Basically, we opened five new bounties yesterday, so I'm, I'm going through them. You're going to have to sit here and listen. Uh, it's PNG export of bitmap images. So at the moment, when I was doing my demo using Paint, the ultimate output of that is a RiskQuest sprite, which isn't desperately useful if you want to give that to someone who's got an Apple Mac or who's got a Windows PC because they can't open sprite files. So... Uh, the idea here is to allow you to add uh, a menu entry or some kind, I'm not quite sure how the GUI will work, but some way of exporting or saving as uh, PNG from both Paint and ChangeFSI, which are the two main uh, bitmap manipulation uh, applications that we supply on the hard disk or in the ROM. Uh, interestingly, in case anyone hasn't noticed, ChangeFSI can import PNGs at the moment, but you ultimately end up with a sprite. So you kind of you're halfway there. You can, you can, if someone sends you a PNG, you can do something with it, but you can't then give them the result back again at the end. And then, I'm pretty sure this one's the last one, uh, is uh, a new bounty in order to uh, update the protocol that uh, Landman FS uses. Um, you may not, there's a lot of... Um, uh, three-letter acronyms and a few five-letter acronyms. Um, at the moment, LAMMANFS, which um, runs in OmniClients, allows you to connect using what at the time was called CIFS. I'm afraid I can't remember what that's short for. Something, something, FS. Yeah. <laughs> um, which um, you might, or you can now, uh, there's now a formalized standard for what that turned into called SMB1, which you can download from Microsoft's website. And that's roughly the dialogue that LAMMANFS talks. But again, it's age-wise, it's late 90s, very early 2000s. Uh, and you'll find now that if you buy a Windows 10 computer, for example, there is no SMB1 anymore. Uh, they have disabled it and possibly even chopped it out. I can't remember where they've gone as far as to chop it out. It's definitely disabled by default. It's just disabled by default. Yeah, okay, so it's still in there if you know where to rummage in the registry. Um, so the idea here is to uh, update the dialogue that uh, LAMMANFS knows how to talk to SMB2. Uh, or SMB3, there is a slight revision on that. It's, they're very similar to each other, so it may end up uh, going to SMB3 just because they're so very similar. That will then allow you to uh, mount shares that are on Apple Macs, uh, Windows 10, or anything that runs Samba. So if, so if you have a, um, a NAS stored in your un under the stairs cupboard serving files around your house, that's probably running Linux, and it probably runs Samba. Uh, so this will allow you to... Um, uh, mount those a lot easier. Uh, and another aspect that is currently horrendously out of date in LAMMANFS is that for its name resolution, so if you try and type in the name of the computer you want to connect to, at the moment it uses a thing called NetBIOS, uh, which dates from mid-80s, something, sometime around then. Uh, and it can be, unless you have actively enabled it on your laptop or done something special, 
chances are the computer at the other end won't recognize what you're saying. You're, you're talking in oldie English uh, and I will not understand you. So simple things like making it easier to connect uh, with other computers or other operating systems. So I talked about 51K of accumulation earlier. So I did a quick, this is a screen capture as at uh, about 10 o'clock last night in the hotel. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, did the, the few numbers that I highlighted, I thought they were quite interesting. So out of, out of 6 billion possible people on earth, the uh, contributions to running RiskOS Open so far this year are 27 pounds, uh, which is an average donation of 13 pound 50. Which by my maths tells me there's two people. So if you're in the room, thank you very much. If you're not in the room, get your wallet out. Uh, another interesting point, and some, someone picked me up on this uh, when I was at the uh, Southwest show, is that one of them is more than 100% of its target. Uh, oh, that's unusual. So the important thing to note is that when we come up with our estimates of how much, each, uh, how much effort each of these will take and then multiply it by McDonald burger flipping rate, uh, we come up with a number, and it can be that no one is interested in, at that number, or they believe it's more work than we do. Um, if, if anyone wants to see any of the project plans, there's no problem digging out the project plans. Um, but they are real. They're not, these numbers aren't plucked out of the sky, or not too much plucked out of the sky. Um, so each of these uh, could easily exceed 100% if we haven't yet attracted a developer um, who's willing to do the work at that rate. Um, but in general, they go... They go somewhere in the 90 to 110 percent. Someone usually picks them up, or usually finds someone who will pick them up. So if you've got an idle weekend, uh, please go to our website and download the latest version of RiskOS 5. Have a play with it. Have a play with Draw and Paint. See if you can break the zooming or try and copy and paste between different clipboard applications. Let us know for something that doesn't work. Further down the line, uh, there are things such as, I, I, I've uh, touched on a lot of bounties today, and I should add that the five that have just been launched come from a list of about 25. So we had to whittle them down thinking, and multi-core support, for example, was on that list. And we thought, well, in practical terms, are there things that's a higher priority to get going on sooner? And the answer ultimately came out as yes. If someone's got some money burning a hole in their pocket, we can open as many bounties as we want. The, the, uh, the um, website will handle as many as we can uh, enter. So if someone wants to stick a rocket under multi-core support, we're all ears and can open a bounty specially for you. Um, but at the moment, the five that we've been opening are um, ones that I think are a good combination of need quickly, need now, and are achievable. The fifth one, coming back to your question earlier, which I haven't talked about today, uh, is that uh, having moved to GitLab, uh, which is one of my earlier slides, uh, is that someone has rightly pointed out that there currently isn't a Git client for RiskOS. So one of the bounties that we will be opening uh, in the next couple of days is uh, aiming to get a stable working version of a Git client so that developers can do everything from the comfort of RiskOS. So at the moment, you would have to download it on a Windows PC or a Windows uh, Mac or Linux, and then copy the files across. Uh, so that's a, a little niggle along the way that we're hoping to, uh, hoping to iron out. And you'll be glad to know I've run out of slides. <laughs> so are there any questions? And if it's a question that you think is more involved, do come over and speak to me or Ben on the stand. We can probably answer it as well. Is there a target date for the release of uh, RiskOS 5.28? So what we've previously been doing is uh, it works on a roughly 18-month cycle for releases. Not always. It, uh, I think 5.24 slipped to more like two years, and I think 5.22 was quite a short one. Generally, it's um, fueled by as bounties complete and you end up with a nice chunk of new functionality, the effort of people, the motivation to get people to do the upgrade, which is quite, you know, I'm sitting here on this laptop's Windows 7, I'm aware that it goes, it goes out of date in about eight months' time or something like that, but the effort of me moving to a different version of the OS is so, so high, uh, I want something that's worth up, upgrading to. And it's a similar philosophy for RiskOS 5, is you, the incremental little changes under the bonnet, they're not that great to look at. So if, for example, we get the um, drag and drop in the desktop finished and the drag and drop in draw finished, that's a nice big 
bullet point that you can hang your hat on and that's worth doing a new release of the OS for. So it's, it's difficult to pin it down a specific time. I would say it's roughly 18 to 24 month kind of time frame. So we've only just hit the one year birthday of the last release. So yeah, you're definitely six months off, I'd say minimum, 12 months maximum, that kind of time frame. Are you planning to support any more hardware? So you know, something like a, a Raspberry Pi, there might be another um, sys, uh, system on chip that you'd be supporting or thinking about? Yeah, so um, I suppose that stepping back a little bit, that Rule themselves don't tend to do the whole hardware port. We, we host them on our website. Um, uh, obviously, there are, there are some exceptions to that. A lot of the Raspberry Pi stuff has been worked on indirectly via, with, with Ben, you know, speaking about Evan earlier, sponsoring the, the noobs update. So yeah, there are some things where, where the guys at Rule do do some of the underlying work, but in general, the different hardware ports are initiated by a manufacturer, uh, Arcomp, for example, uh, will start a new port to a new project. So the bits that are held in common, like the support in the kernel for the different ARM cores, that does tend to be a thing that Rule knows about or, or manages, but the actual uh, ports to the specific bits of hardware tend to be driven by manufacturers rather than Rule. Um, so, yeah, the Raspberry Pi is an easy example. Uh, there is a, now a Raspberry Pi 3 Plus Compute module, which uh, I uh, have arranged to get a sample of the module for that, sorry, a sample of the uh, board for that, so that we can then update the corresponding uh, Raspberry Pi port so yeah, that is something that, yeah, again, Rule has got quite intimately involved with, but in general, it's, it's third-party uh, manufacturers. All good. Run out of questions. <laughs> One more. Um, what about 64-bit uh, compatibility? Because uh, hardware, 32-bit hardware is not going to be around forever, and a lot of the new SOCs won't support uh, 32 bits. Yes, yes, you're quite right that uh, there's there's a, um, a sliding uh, timeline where we were lucky that 26-bit processors were still around, and then we fell off the end of that cliff and suddenly, oh crap, we need to do 32-bit quick, 32-bit, uh, which caught I think caught Acorn on the hop. Really, the, they could have done, they could have made that transition during the RISC PC transition when. 32-bit became available, and then it would have been a lot less uh, panic when you fall off the end. You know, can't buy any strong arms anymore. What are we going to do? Uh, and yes, there is a similar horizon approaching that 64-bit processors will become the norm, and 32-bit processors will no longer be available. We're not yet, not there yet, um, but there are some. The more recent, is it the Cortex A53. You can buy that one, or you can license that from ARM, and they've turned off the 32-bit part of it. So you can still buy 32-bit chips today. So we're still safe for a couple of years. But yes, there is a horizon approaching of 64-bit. And that's part of the motivation behind whenever you read these bounty descriptions or you see um, the, uh, the work that's going on, there's a stipulation that says, please write it in a high-level language. We've got to stop, stop hand-tweezering all this assembler all the time because the assembler instruction set for a 64-bit processor is totally different to a 32-bit processor. If we get to the point where, you know, let's say, 60% of the OS is written in C, then migrating to that, although it's still painful, it is at least a compiler task. So you only need to change one thing, and suddenly 60% of the OS is 64-bit compatible for relatively little effort. So yeah, it's a horizon that's coming. Watch out. 64 bits is the future. In that case, thank you very much, Rob okay. Sprouton. Thank you.